training shop called Prototypal. You may have heard of me. Um, so I'm giving a talk uh, that's kind of generically titled right now, Taming CSS and Ember.js Apps. And I'm curious, how many of you have already seen this talk? <laughs> so it, I've been refining it. And so it's not really the same talk if you've seen it already. So uh, there's some, I've added a bunch of stuff to it. And you'll hopefully appreciate that. So um, anyways, I do training and stuff. Check it out. Prototype.io, that's my plug. Um, all right, so show of hands. Who likes CSS in the room? All right, who does not like CSS? Raise your hand. All right, so it's about 50-50 from what I can tell. Um, but right, CSS is awesome. Um, uh, I, I don't typically, I'm really lucky, I don't typically have to write a lot of CSS because I work with teams and usually there's some like really great CSS guru on the team that deals with most of the problems for me, uh, just makes things look beautiful. Um, so I would say that I am a practitioner of the trying stuff until it works model of CSS development. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, I don't, it, it's kind of this weird uh, phenomenon for me because I like go work with a great team and I've worked with a lot of great teams over the years doing Ember Consulting. And when I'm by myself, I feel somewhat crippled. Like I can't actually deliver the same quality of work visually that I uh, can when I have a great CSS guru on the team. And obviously like having great designers is important too. Um, and so, uh, CSS frustrates me. I feel like sometimes I'm still doing web development with assembly. Um, and, you know, like we, every time we build a new application, there's like lots of problems to solve, uh, even building on top with Ember. And sometimes I just want a button that has the, all the appropriate states that a button should have that works on desktop and mobile and all these things. And wouldn't that be nice? Um, and I think, uh, you know, from that desire, it has led me to focus a lot of my attention on CSS over the last uh, couple years. And so I think CSS is actually great. Um, uh, but why, so why do I care about CSS and why do I think you should as well? So, uh, well, I got started uh, by kind of giving a lightning talk at EmberConf a couple years ago in 2015. And I wrote an add-on like in a couple hours before EmberConf called Ember Component CSS. Um, because I had like been feeling this problem for a long time. I work with a lot of different teams. I see like all the different kinds of weird problems that different teams run into. And it felt like nobody had good patterns for organizing CSS. So I wanted, at the time we, had, we were thinking pods was a good idea in its current form. And I was like, oh, well, we have these directories for components. Why don't we put a CSS file in it? Seems obvious. Nobody seemed to have done that yet. And so I wrote this add-on to do that. And then I like, actually started thinking harder about the problem of component-based CSS. Um, the other thing that's kind of uh, made me care about this problem is that new pods are coming, I like to call them. There's an RFC called module, is it module unification this thing? OK, module unification RFC, which is basically new pods. So if you've used pods, you should look at the module unification RFC if you haven't yet. Um, we're going to be having a new file system structure. It's an evolution of pods. And at some point, it's likely going to be turned on as the default in new Ember CLI apps. The old style will still work, but we're going to have a new default. And when we do, there certainly are going to be, is going to be still that desire for having some kind of styles.css file inside of your directory. Uh, if you don't know anything about module unification in RFC, you should watch Robert's talk from Ember NYC. Um, so um, there's going to be this need for Ember having some kind of story for how CSS gets organized in your app. And it's actually a complicated problem. I don't think we, don't, I don't think we just want to concatenate all these files into one big file. I think we want to do something a little better than that. Um, so um, I also want to just make writing CSS as enjoyable and mechanical and predictable as I feel like writing Ember apps are. Like I feel like a lot, I've talked to a lot of people about this. It's like a, once you get up the learning curve and you're like building an, a big Ember app, it like kind of feels like it's a bit boring after a while because it's just like, oh, the same thing, repeat the same pattern here, the same pattern here, just a little bit different. Uh, and that's nice, that like helps your velocities. And I wanna feel that way about CSS and not feel like, oh, I made some 
small mistake, and now it has had widespread problems in my code base. Um, and so um, I think it's important uh, as a framework for us to help people fall into the pit, pit of success uh, continually in every regard uh, in our, that involves our programming model. And I feel like CSS is one of these places where we don't have any good story. We don't have, I mean, there are add-ons that have stories that are pretty good. But we don't, as a framework, have a story, which means that the knowledge of an Ember developer might not, uh, regarding CSS, might not be portable across teams like the general knowledge about Ember is. And so it'd be nice for Ember to have a story for this and for somebody who's new to web programming to not have to know all the different you know, uh, CSS methodologies to avoid the common pitfalls that you're likely going to run into. And you probably won't realize you've ran into them until it's too late and you've written a ton of CSS that now you have to refactor to perhaps be a bit more uh, friendly to your app at scale. So um, I also think, and this is actually like I'm burying the lead here, I think this is actually the most important reason that Ember needs to have a CSS story, which is that if you ask, there's probably a lot of add-on authors in the room, raise your hand if you have an add-on that includes, that should include CSS to some degree or does already. All right, so if I asked all these people individually right now and said, What's the story for you including CSS in your add-on and making it accessible or customizable to your add-on users? I would probably get at least three different answers, right? There's actually not a great story in the Ember add-on ecosystem right now for styling extensibility, like even just how to include CSS so that it's ordered properly in the build output, it can be a problem. Uh, I think right now the best solution is basically your add-on needs to like give SAS to the user, and then the user has to manually at import the SAS file somewhere in their file. And that's not a great story. I mean, it's fine for importing, but like now we, I want to customize the way it looks. How do I do that? There's not really a story for that. And that's unfortunate, I think. So speaking more generally, there are some problems with CSS um, that I want to just point out so that, oh, my slide's blank. What happened? How long? What slide did that stop at? All right, so anyways, we want to make, it, uh, we want to make everybody fall in the pit of success. We want to have best practices for our add-on ecosystem. Uh, here are the problems with CSS in brief. So it, CSS is kind of a weird globals-based programming model. I'll talk more about that. Lack of modularity, encapsulation, and isolation primitives are pretty flat. Um, it's very difficult to refactor and remove dead CSS code, or even know that CSS code is dead. It's not used anymore. Uh, my, a lot of my early thoughts were based off of a great talk uh, by a member of the React core team. Um, you should check out this talk. Although I don't think that CSS and JavaScript is actually the best answer for this. I think one of the things that we've tried to do in Ember has always made the framework. We've learned a lot of lessons from the, our parent project. We came from Sprout Core, and Sprout Core had a very uh, tough learning curve. You thought Ember was hard. You should have tried to use Sprout Core and extend its built-in UI components um, much, much harder. And so we believe that if you understand HTML, CSS, and some basic JavaScript, you should be able to be proficient writing an Ember app. You shouldn't have to learn anything uh, super, super custom. Uh, HTML and CSS are very powerful. We should embrace them, perhaps augment them, right? And so I've tried to make, I've tried to formulate a lot of my thoughts on CSS and my solution um, exploration to constrain us to actually still use CSS. I think it's a little easy to just quickly be like, you know what? It's easier to just solve these problems in JavaScript, so I'm just going to run and use JavaScript instead. I think that's fine, but I, I do think uh, for widespread adoption, it makes sense to still keep CSS and CSS. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about globals. So what do I mean by globals? Well, every rule you define in a style sheet is now effectively a global variable in your application, right? So um, the good news is that there are approaches that have been created in the you know, CSS communities, things like BEM, SMAX, SUIT, et cetera. They're methodologies for how you write CSS and organize it. Um, they've come up with some good solutions to these problems that are not uh, super sophisticated, but they're basically naming conventions. So if you have a nice naming convention, you can basically avoid some amount of pitfall 
of potentially globally leaking uh, unintentionally across you know styles um, for one component to another, something like that, right? Um, there is somewhat good news as well, which is that Shadow DOM is coming. So Shadow DOM is a nice primitive that gives us style encapsulation. Um, I don't know that it's going to be the uh, a total like solution to all of the problems that exist in this space. I don't really think it is. I think it's a nice primitive. I would have liked to see something a little more primitive from it. Um, but um, it's important to think about that uh, and plan for it in the future. So I've been, I've been trying to think about that as well. Um, so just an important thing that I would challenge you to do is when you're writing CSS or thinking about problems in CSS, I would ask that you actually try to convert them, take the problem, and say, if this was JavaScript, what would I do? And that I think kind of, it's actually a little hard to do that to some degree, especially if you're like a CSS expert and you have a lot of dogma around the way that you write CSS already. It can be a little challenging, but CSS is really unlike any other programming language where you know, it, this kind of global based programming model it ha has, and the, the best practices that have been, we've all been kind of indoctrinated with to some extent, have, um, really force us into a way of thinking that I think can be uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, dangerous for building large applications at scale. Um, so the good news is, though, with preprocessors like SAS, we can kind of have something uh, module-esque. We can have separate files, right? Without a preprocessor, there's no way to actually have separate CSS files that don't end up being separate HTTP requests, right? Just like with JavaScript modules, we want to take a bunch of individual files, squash them into one, and send them down. Uh, we can do that with a preprocessor. So at least part of this problem is somewhat solved. Um, but when we kind of think about the, the talking points around like refactoring or being able to delete CSS, it's actually pretty tricky uh, to do these things. And I, and I believe that like part of the problem here is um, a lack of encapsulation. And the, sty the, the patterns that we use to do composition with CSS are a bit broken, and they make refactoring very difficult because they intermix uh, concerns from the like provider of the base styling and the consumer of it who might be overriding things. So I think this is best demonstrated by the idea of being able to uh, use something like Bootstrap. You know, let's say you start using Bootstrap in version two and you had to, maybe you did some amount of custom overrides using SAS or less variables, right, to change the colors, and then you did some amount of overrides that were runtime class, uh, you know, uh, augmentation, so you had like BTN my theme, right, or BTN my app that you added on top of a BTN and it made it look the way you wanted. Um, well, now when you want to, now when BTN, when the button in Bootstrap changes, you have made a bunch of overrides, but the way in which you overrode was coupled to the implementation at that exact point in time, right? So if Bootstrap wants to change, if Bootstrap wants to change the way that its style, its classes are defined, like if it wanted to start using a different CSS property or something, well, your override was written to assume that it used certain properties previously. And since you've coupled like that, there's no encapsulation, there's no actual public API between these two things, and it becomes this ball of mud, which makes it very hard to upgrade things like Bootstrap, certainly within point releases, but I'm sure they put a lot of uh, effort into not having breaking changes in, in minor point releases, but certainly Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3, I'm wondering, has anybody been able to successfully do an upgrade like that before, right? Has anybody, like, usually what I've heard people say is, like, we just give up and, like, rewrite a lot of markup, basically, or we'll like, rebuild our components to be Bootstrap 3 things instead of Bootstrap 2 things or whatever. Um, it's very, very difficult, and I don't think it should be. Um, so I think the main takeaway, uh, my main insight here is that I think we actually need explicit public APIs for styling. Um, and so I think, like I said, this is the big point. We need custom, we need like, an actual API between our implementing component and our extension on top of it. And components already have public APIs. We use this kind of stuff all the time, right? Why don't our styles? And I think functions are a good metaphor to kind of think about this problem. So functions take arguments and they return values. 
right? At least pure, f and, and in uh, components, they do the same thing. Components are like functions that render a template and return DOM, right? And so we give arguments to our function, and its return value is dependent upon those arguments. They tend to be pure a good amount of the time, right? And but the issue is, I think, kind of at the crux of the problems in CSS is that CSS doesn't have functions. And so there's no actual way of having some kind of indirection or some kind of local scope that you can work within and that doesn't leak out to uh, the world around it. And so the good news is that SAS kind of has a function primitive that makes sense, I think, for usage. And that is mixins. So SAS has mixins, and they're like functions that take arguments, and they return CSS rules that have had those arguments interpolated into them, right? So um, you could imagine having a pattern where you implement a, you write a SAS mixin for your component, and then you can import, you can uh, actually use that mixin to define rules that are scoped to some particular uh, class name. And if you had nested rules in here, you can use like ampersand to have them uh, concatenate against the, the main selector here. Um, but you know the fun these functions are these like primitive units of work, and you can't really have composition without functions. And so it it's hard to imagine building ambitious applications like the ones that we're all building without a code composition story. And I think we've been you know kind of uh, for too long accepting of the status quo for styling. Just like a lot of developers don't have to deal with it, so they just don't worry about it. But I think it's actually a limiting factor to our ecosystem being able to grow and flourish. And so I have some ideas on how we can solve this. I think it's not super controversial at all, I don't think, that the, the idea that we should be able to organize our CSS around the components who have templates that use that CSS. And ideally, when you define CSS in a component CSS file, that CSS should only be used by the template for that component. And if you had shared CSS that wasn't just a, another component that you called from more than one place, you could imagine having doing what you would do in JavaScript, where you would create some module where that was shared across multiple components, right? And just import them and reuse the same things, right? So you, you can imagine this model working. And Ember Component CSS has a story for that today to some extent. Um, I think the other solution that we kind of need is actually a mechanism for actually namespacing our styles to be globally unique per component. And I've taken just a little, I've borrowed the syntax of BEM. If you're not familiar with it, it's very, very simple. It, BEM stands for block element modifier. And basically, block is always a component in Ember. So the idea is have a naming system that's prefixed with the component name. And then it does like a double dash or a double underscore. And it either uh, you have like the element name, which could be like some sub part of the DOM inside of your component, or you can have a modifiers which are like disabled, loading, whatever, um, that reflect states of particular pieces of your component's DOM. Um, so really, I'm just borrowing the double dash nest, uh, naming from BEM, and you'll see this here. So this is the kind of uh, style sheet and template we would like to be able to write. The annoying thing about BEM is that you, it's a lot of manual labor. And every time I've, like, you know, I go around and I talk to people about these problems, they're like, yeah, we you know, we want it. Uh, we want to like do something about it, but we don't want to manually write out all these long prefixes to our class names, and you know, um, it's it's really annoying to do that repetitively. And so it would be ideal to just be able to reuse CSS kind of naively, the way that we would expect to. Like, you know, the first time we, you know, uh, looked at W3 schools and learned about CSS or whatever, we learned how to write it like this, probably. And it would be nice if that actually scaled up. So what could we do? Well, we could auto BEM it for you using build tools. So it's pretty trivial in Ember CLI to do something like this right now, where basically what was a foo class name in your my component CSS file, we could actually rewrite that to be BEMed for you. And then also, when it's referred to in your component's template, we could also auto BEM it there. And so you get to kind of be naive, enjoy the non-verbosity of BEM, but get the benefits of it, right? Um, so, so that's cool. But really, there's a, still a problem here, which is that somebody on your team who doesn't quite understand my, what might be going on, they might look at 
the, uh, the element inspector and see like, oh, this thing looks the way that I want it to. And they're going to want to grab that CSS class and then use it in another place, right? The proper way of doing that would be to like hoist out the shared CSS into a mixin that could be invoked by both components or whatever per se. But I think it's important to actually kind of be a little defensive about this um, and potentially have some kind of hashing mechanism where basically we can uh, generate something that's a little ugly, perhaps in dev mode, uh, to prevent people from making these kinds of mistakes. Um, so you could also imagine, by the way, in like production mode, we could actually minify the selectors, which would be interesting. It would reduce our CSS payloads. Um, so the problem right here, though, is that like this is a cool system for auto beming, basically, which is neat. But it doesn't act, add anything really to the composability and extensibility story uh, to make us uh, you know, move towards a, a path of having an actual public API for our components. Uh, styles and when we might want to override them. And so I think we need functions to pull that off. And so, like I mentioned, mixins are a good technique for, for doing this. And so you could imagine being able to write this. So we're writing a my button component. And this button, let's say, has a public API of like, it only expects you, obviously, there would probably be more than more variables here. But basically, you would, it only expects its border color to be changed, right? And simply by having uh, this argument available for usage from, our other, from other consumers, potentially we want to create a primary button that has a different border color, we could actually create a primary button component that changed the border color, but didn't actually change it in a way that meant that its implementation was locked in, so uh, that it was locked into the implementation of my button at any point in time. Right? So we've added this kind of function barrier here, which lets us have some amount of indirection. So if, in this case, it might seem silly, but if we attributed the border color, if we added the border color to the element in some other technique, I think a good example for this is if you have gradient borders. If you want to do gradient borders, it's actually you have to add some markup, do a gradient background, and then inset another element, one pixel around it, or however many pixels your border colors, or your border width is. Um, and so basically, different markup hierarchies and different CSS uh, you know, uh, styling techniques could actually break you know, the, your, your overrides. right? But with a system like this, we actually can choose where to apply this, uh, this variable, right? this local argument. So this is kind of very, this is very verbose. I don't want you to have to write this in every single, for every single component. So I, thought that Ember component CSS could give us some sugar, which would be an at component. Um, and at component basically is just expanding. You could imagine it as string replace in a build tool that's like at component replace with at mixin, whatever the name of the CSS file is. So in our case here, this is akin to writing at mixin my button, but we don't have to repeat the component name. And that's also nice if we rename files, or if this is a pod and we rename the, the pods directory, all these names will be appropriately synced up. We won't be repeating them. So um, the other cool thing here is that Ember Component CSS actually includes it by default. There's basically a naming convention, right? The mixin gets named the same thing as the component. We invoke the mixin automatically for you. All right, so cool story, Eric. Um, here's basically the primary button example. So if you wanted to create a primary button component, all you would have to do is simply pass in a different color into the uh, mixin provided by my button, and uh, you can imagine this working pretty nicely. So, with a simple mechanism like this, you actually end up encapsulating uh, the styling uh, of the underlying component that you might be ex extending. And so, this might not seem all that useful for the kinds of components that you're building in your app, um, but it's actually uh, pretty important to solving some of the, the bigger problems at large with uh, doing styling overrides and styling in a large ecosystem. So I really think encapsulation is like the crux of the problem in CSS, and having some kind of primitive for encapsulating uh, helps solve a good number of those issues that I identified before. Obviously, the, the BEM style rewriting and stuff does too. So let's talk a bit actionable here. 
what's, what's the plan forward? Um, so I want to ship an Ember component CSS 1.0 um, that does a bunch of stuff for you. Um, so first of which, it would auto BEM. So if you had that CSS file defined, it would automatically rewrite your classes to be uh, globally unique. I also want it to do some linting. So there's some obvious bad patterns that you should not be doing inside of a component CSS file that will cause styles to leak outside of it. Ideally, you want the styles, like I said earlier, you want the styles you define in your component CSS file to only apply to the template of that CSS file. And so we're going to need some good linting tools to help you avoid shooting yourself in the foot, incidentally. Um, I think it's also very important to have a uh, purview for the future. And I really think about Ember Component CSS as kind of like building a bridge to Shadow DOM, potentially. Because a lot of this build rewriting stuff could potentially just get turned off once every browser you support supports Shadow DOM. Um, and the build system could actually generate you CSS files for each shadow root automatically or something. Um, and so I want it to have a story for onboarding the Shadow DOM. So maybe there's even like in, in one, I, I want it to at least have a story. Uh, like I want to make sure that it's compatible, forward, forward's compatible with the Shadow DOM. But it would be cool if in 1.0 we could also actually have a switch. Like if you only cared about supporting mobile, like specific modern browsers that had Shadow DOM support, you could actually turn off some of the build rewriting stuff and just use Shadow DOM instead, which would be kind of cool. Um, there's also uh, the idea of having a JavaScript module API to actually being able to import your CSS files from JavaScript. Because sometimes there are variables or values that you don't want to repeat twice. You don't want to have the value be in your style sheet and in your JavaScript code. Ideally, you could have those variables or those values from a class definition be accessible uh, from both places. And so I think that would be a cool thing to explore as well. So um, my intent is to uh, ship a 1.0 of Ember Component CSS and then uh, soon after submit a CSS RFC to Ember because I would like to make Ember Component CSS the default uh, in Ember CLI. So when you, get Ember CLI, when you install Ember CLI, you create a new app, you're going to get Ember Component CSS built into it. Um, but there is a blocking problem here. Basically, um, the new pods RFC, I think it doesn't really make sense to make Ember Component CSS a default until we switch, uh, we start using new pods. And so once new pods gets implemented, that would be the time to start talking about it. I think it also might be blocking, some, you know, it's not strictly blocking the release of an Ember Component CSS 1.0, but I think it would be kind of weird to ship it without making sure that it was compatible with new pods. Um, but that might be possible without it being a hard blocker. So when can we have it? I, I hear this question all the time. There's a lot of people that want to use this now. Um, I don't, you know, I want to ship it. My intent is if new, when new pods ships, I want this to ship alongside of it because you're going to, there's going to be some class of new Ember user perhaps that's going to, or existing Ember users that switch to new pods or are using something and they want to have a story for the CSS files. And I, I don't want there to be any gap in having a story for CSS in the new pod format. So that's my intent. Um, but it's going to definitely take longer to like get it through the RFC process and all the bike shedding that, that involves uh, to become the actual default inside of an Ember app or something. And I don't know. That's, that's kind of my ambitious goal, but it, I, it may never, I may not survive the bike shedding. Um, so that could be it, but it's not. So I am very frustrated um, with the way that we uh, build Ember apps today. Um, primarily, I think we are all actually still in reinventing a wheel. Um, we have all bought into the promise of Ember and not building our own frameworks. But if you are a large uh, company, uh, or even you know, small companies as well, what is probably one of the first things you do when you start building a new Ember app, you're probably going to have to build or find a bunch of components to implement your app with. And there's no actual like standard library of components. Ember has some components, 
It's actually shed its standard library. There was a select component that was not very good that got removed for good reason. But um, it doesn't actually have a good standard library of components. So what do we end up doing? We end up either assembling our standard library in our apps by building them ourselves or using add-ons from the ecosystem. But what can that mean? Well, that could mean like I'm installing a bunch of Ember add-ons, but the way that I have to style each individual one is completely different than the other. And there's no actual guarantees that you don't install Ember add-ons that have conflicting CSS with other Ember add-ons. I've heard recently a story of somebody installing like a tooltip library, and the, the, like, uh, the add-on expected to be able to use a class name that was used somewhere else in their app. I think Bootstrap was using it or something. And so they actually had an experience, which I don't think is acceptable in the Ember ecosystem, of Ember installing an add-on and it not just working. It should just work. And so I think that's why Ember Component CSS is important for the add-on ecosystem. But I also don't think we should all be styling things or overriding thing, uh, styles in many different ways. We should have conventions for doing that. And so the reason that I've actually cared about this CSS work so much is that I think we can build higher and we can build cooler things on top of these primitives. And so I really think there's a huge potential to unlock new abilities and new abstractions with if we shore up the styling story in our ecosystem. And so one of those things is theming. I really would like a story where you can basically, uh, you know, Ember install a theme and all of the components in your app get auto-styled based off of some consistent theming format. Um, I think that it's just a matter of building up conventions. Um, it's obviously a very hard problem. Theming is not just CSS. Theming also involves potentially being able to override JavaScript and HTML markup to, a, to achieve the desired result that you might be wanting to have in your app or your theme. Um, I think another thing that would be awesome would be automatic style guides. Like, why do we all build style guides manually if there was a conventional way of defining some demos for our uh, components in add-ons, then every time you ever installed, the component you just installed could automatically show up in your style guide. That would be pretty cool. And if you imagine having both an automatic style guide and a theming system, that would be that automatic style guide would be a pretty cool place to play with customizing your theming, because you'd be able to see all of the components that you have installed in one place. So I've been feeling like maybe we should build a standard UI library for Ember that has theming support. Um, and then we can start on level five instead of level three, right, of, the, uh, of building our apps. Right now, you know, Ember gets us. It's better than compiling our own, you know, going out, finding the right kind of boilerplate that we're going to need to do our build tools and all this stuff. We get to start on a nice uh, stable ground, a nice foundation, but we then end up, and every company I work with has their own versions of different kinds of components. I've probably seen 15 autocompletes. And they all have problems. Every different company's UI library has some different variation. Some are good at some things. Some are bad at others. Um, almost nobody does fully, well, uh, fully baked, accessible UI components. And if we actually rallied around building a single good standard UI library, we could actually have amazing accessibility automatically in every single app. We could have good keyboard fo focusing, good, like an actual modal that worked for every use case. Right, um, And so um, I've built some prototypes of these features already. I've been working on this stuff for a while. And I want to show you a little bit of a demo of what I think is possible. So let's see. This is going to be, I have pre-recorded some GIFs here. So let's see if they work OK. So this is an example of a style guide that's getting automatically generated. And it has a little theme editor on the sidebar. And as you modify properties here in the theme editor, it's actually hot reloading the CSS. And you can actually see, as I change certain properties, like the default color, the font, the background color, and the border radius in these cases, the components are auto-styling themselves. And all these components are built in a standard way that assumes you know, certain styling abilities. And so 
you can have the concept of a global theme or even some uh, subcontextual theme and um, be able to just change a few variables like you probably already have if you're using Bootstrap or if you've built your own system, you probably have some form of variables. But the cool thing about this is that this isn't just limited to CSS. So um, let's look at this next demo here. So this is, a st this is an inspector. So sometimes you have global things, but you also have component-specific styleable properties. So what if you could actually, like in the Elements tab of DevTools, click on a, a little magnifying glass, click on any component in your app, whether it was in your actual app or in the style guide, and immediately see what the styleable properties were for that component. That would be very, very cool. Right? So if you wanted to uh, you know, start with you know, global kinds of overrides, you could do that pretty easily. Um, but you're always going to potentially have some edge case where like, maybe on this, maybe on my buttons, I don't want border radius. So I want to be able to choose the button and override its border radius specifically. And then, of course, you could also imagine being able to swap themes in an, in an actual app. And so here's kind of our base, what we call our base theme here. And we've been playing with writing different themes. And so we've got like an alternative theme here that just renders with vibrant colors. And you'll notice the theme editor and the style guide UI here, which I'll demo in a second, is actually written using the component library. So as we change the themes, its buttons are changing. And here's a material theme. So you could imagine not needing to have specific component implementations for every you know, um, specific kind of look and feel. You could imagine potentially being able to write some kind of theme. Now, the cool thing is that themes are not just CSS in this system. They're actually uh, uses a form of component delegation. So we have common, U common UI components that you'll use, like the buttons and the, the uh, text fields and everything that you use in your app aren't actually tied to a specific theme, but based on what the current active theme is, they delegate to a different component that's responsible for rendering them. Um, and those components can be implemented by themes. And they can choose to just write CSS, or they could choose to write handlebars and JavaScript as well to change their behavior. So we can implement a very sophisticated kind of uh, system, like material design is a pretty sophisticated uh, uh, visual theme because it has many different behavioral changes. It does like nice little ripples and stuff. And that is fully possible uh, with this architecture right now. So these are the pre-recorded demos. Let me just show you briefly. How am I doing on time? Um, here it is in action. Now, something that I didn't have a pre-recorded demo of, which I think is pretty cool, is that part of the style guide is toggling between different forms of the same component. So like we have a default button style, but we also have I don't know how to I don't know what to call these yet. I'm calling them kinds currently or traits. So there's like a primary button, which is just a variant of default. And so in the style guide, you can actually see, and this is automatically generated. We can like we can read, we can see what components exist in the component library or what components have been installed that are third party that subscribe to the contracts of the system. And we can automatically populate the style guide with the appropriate buttons and stuff here. So there's default and primary. Now, the other cool thing we're doing is we have a standard way of uh, defining states of a component. And states, in this case, is a pretty generic concept. I would say the idea to think about is that you know, buttons are in active states, focused states, disabled states. So that's the kind of, but you could actually create arbitrary states as well. So the style guide also supports automatically letting you see and interact with all these components in their different possible states. So Here's the button in its active state. And I can toggle that off and dis choose to disable it as well. Or I can focus it, see what it looks like when it's focused, and also look at it in its loading state, which is not like a CSS typical state. It's something that I augmented it with. And so these buttons have a loading state as well. And this is all well formed. There's a conventional way for building these things uh, and defining these states so that the style guides can also automatically display them for you. And these are not mutually exclusive either. So you can actually, if you wanted to, if it was po possible for a button to be active and disabled, this is what it would look like. Right? So these aren't just always mutually exclusive states. They can, can, they can be concurrent currently. Um, so, um, so let's see. Um, I don't know how much there really is all that interesting to show here. But you can kind of see we've been playing with uh, 
a bunch of different components to play with the different kinds of styling APIs. I think one of the things that's pretty interesting here, and I don't know that this is the best page to demo it on. Um, let's see. So we've been working on a nice responsive table that has a very nice API that allows you to basically define the table's layout as different breakpoints. So you can imagine at certain screen resolutions, it switches to being a list instead of being more of a grid kind of table. And so this kind of stuff is pretty neat. And we've been, we've been trying to exercise out this kind of theming, these theming primitives to build some fairly complicated things. But all that said, let's go back to our slides here. What is going on? There we go. So that's a little bit of demo of what I've been doing behind the scenes, playing with this CSS, these CSS primitives that I want us to have in the Ember ecosystem. Um, I, you know, we've been kind of promoting the idea that Ember is the SDK for the web, but we're only really starting to scratch the surface, I think, of what's actually possible. I think we can really uh, build higher, right? And I really want to build a lot of these things because I go around to many different companies, do consulting and training and stuff, and everybody ends up kind of doing the same thing. And we should just share, ideally have a standard component UI layer that we can all share. And we can custom, it should be customizable enough for us to get the right look and feel that we want in our apps, but without having to write all of that code and maintain it ourselves. Um, and so I need your help. I've, I'm giving this talk as a pitch to help me because there's a lot of work to be done here. And so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, please reach out to me. Um, and let's build higher together. So that's all. Thank you.